Thank you for tuning in to Hacks and Hobbies with your host, Junaid. In season two of Hacks and Hobbies, we're visited by our amazing guests coming from all walks of life who want to learn their story, their struggles, and their journey on how they got to where they are today. So stick around. In this episode, we get to speak with Michelle Pena. She's a publishing and social media consultant. And to be honest with you, I've I met her a few LinkedIn locals ago and um, been keeping in touch and following her journey. And uh, she's a writer, editor, designer, filmmaker, and a speaker. And she is a very cool individual. And I've been, uh, she's been busy and we've all been busy, but we finally have her here on the podcast. So Michelle, welcome to the podcast. Hello. Thank you so much, Janaid, for having me on. I'm really excited to be with you. You're welcome. Absolutely. Um, we've, we've seen a lot of your awesome videos and your really cool filmmaking. And I was looking and I was looking at your LinkedIn profile and we have 409 mutual connections. Like, wow. wow. <laughs> All great people. I know. <laughs> Absolutely great people. So Michelle, in, tell us a little bit about yourself, you know, how you got started, what makes you tick and what's your journey? Sure. Yeah, I'd love to talk about that. Um, for those of you who are new to learning about who I am, I'm Michelle Pena, as Janaid already so kindly introduced me, and I'm located in the Washington, D.C. metro area. Um, and I'll, I'll start um, backwards a little bit and bring you to you know the point in my career where I'm at today. So uh, many years ago, I started working as a technical writer, and then I transitioned to being a publishing director, and then worked exclusively for many years as a graphic designer. And that tends to surprise a lot of people. They don't realize that I had that background as well. But I I worked exclusively. I think maybe you didn't even know either, Janaid. So, and that was a lot of fun and and really fed my creative um, appetite. Um, cause I, have just, you know, very, very creatively driven in, in whatever career I, mm-hmm. career interests I've ever had. Um, and then after working as a graphic designer, I actually left that job unexpectedly, um, because I thought that I was going to be relocating from DC to Chicago. And then a long story short, we actually didn't have to relocate. So that was great news, but unfortunately in the process of thinking that I was moving, I gave my boss at the time ample notice. <laughs> so they, this may be a good lesson for, for all of you out there. Probably you don't want to give your, your uh, employer too much notice in case things change, um, which was my case. I ended up not having to move. And the week I found out that I was able to stay in the D.C. area was the same week my replacement at work started. <laughs> so I was literally training my replacement when I got the news. And uh, so it was talk about uh, mixed feelings. Um, I was excited, but, you know, sad. Um, you know, my boss and I had cried <laughs> together when I told her I was moving because we have such a great working relationship. Uh, yeah. But but actually, this real experience really taught me that, you know, life has so many unexpected twists and turns. And we don't know what the heck it's doing. We don't know where it's taking us sometimes. And mm-hmm. it just never pays to panic because I'm actually in a much more interesting space right now, career-wise. And I would have never made the leap if I didn't go through that. Um, so I still work for the same B2B publisher called Business Management Daily. Mm-hmm. Um, I worked for them for many years in that graphic design capacity. And then I resigned, <laughs> ended up staying in the area. And they called me back after a few months because they had a position open up in their editorial department. They knew that I had somewhat of a a writing background, Um, but it wasn't really a writing job. It was more of a copy editing job. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I was just so happy to get back into the company because I knew I was going to be working with a a fantastic team and they were located just 10 minutes from my house, uh, which was important to me because I have kids and and they were near, near the office. So I took this job and worked as a copy editor pretty exclusively for almost two years. And really enjoyed it. But, you know, honestly, like after those first couple of years, I started to just get really tired of the monotony of that particular role. 
Mm-hmm. And I just needed to do something a little bit different. And I guess that speaks to my personality. I'm not really the kind of person that can be satisfied working, um, staying in, in one box. I, it's hard, mm-hmm. it's hard for people to define me because I'm always changing what I do. Yeah. Um, it's hard for me to even understand <laughs> where, where I'm taking myself in the next few years. Um, I try not to think too long term. I, I stay a little bit more in the present. But, uh, anyway, after working in that copy editing role, I, you know, I wanted to stay in the same company and started to look for opportunities within the company to create like a new enterprises for myself, things that mm. would feed my creative needs and yet still be valuable for my team. So I spoke with um, a couple of my colleagues and learned that they actually were in need of support, writing support. Um, they needed someone to help them bring in more original content for their publications, their their books, mm-hmm. primarily their newsletters. So uh, that opened up a whole new door for me to start writing again, because actually it had been a long time since I was writing it, many, many years. Uh-huh. So I was able to get back into writing and that has just snowballed over the past, uh, I'd say, year because mm-hmm. I'm doing very little of the copy editing now. Thankfully, I had another colleague that was interested in absorbing some of that workload. So mm-hmm. that enabled me to reinvest my efforts in an area that I was just going to have a lot more fun with and would still be of value to the organization. So it's been awesome. Um, you know, the, the writing, most of the writing that I do uh, revolves mm-hmm. around personal development uh, issues. Yeah. And that works out great for their publications. They produce a lot of different um, things that are uh, designed for people working in management capacities or leaders, um, administrative professionals, Mm -hmm. uh, business management professionals in general. It's just the topics I write about lend themselves well to the wide spectrum of uh, publications that they produce. And that is what originally got me on LinkedIn was trying to share my articles and seeing how they would be received by by the larger community out there on the web. (laughs) That's so cool. So so how many articles have you been able to share with the the community well, on LinkedIn. Yeah, I have a lot more I'm, I'm going to be putting up. I've only, I think I've only posted five of the dozens, okay. dozens that I've written. Um, mm-hmm. I need to go back on and, and post them. Originally, I was posting those first articles because I was a little bit nervous um, yes. about getting back into writing. I felt excited about it, but also kind of bashful um, mm-hmm. because I, I don't necessarily... Uh, like to be front and center. Like I, I'm not the type of personality that's really extroverted, despite what you see from some of mm-hmm. my videos. I'm actually quite the introvert. Uh, I'm not shy, but I'm just more introverted, which is which is different. But mm-hmm. you know, when you are writing and doing social media and doing videos, you really have to put yourself out there. And so, me sharing those those early articles, it was a reflection of the baby steps I was taking at that point in my career when I was. Um, starting to get back into writing and mm-hmm. looking for that positive reinforcement from whoever I could connect with online. And LinkedIn was uh, a new space for me back then as well. Even though I had my account for so many years, yeah. it just sat there collecting dust. You know, it was, I had to clear the cobwebs and like mm-hmm. log back in and figure out what my password was. And then it just, again, snowball. There was that word. It just, the community was so uh, loving and engaging and uh, and uplifting. I just fell in love with with the whole LinkedIn family, and that I met online, and the relationships I've developed off the platform, including our friendship. Janae is very uh, special to me. So uh, I just it's been nothing but nothing but uh, good things all year long coming from my interaction online. Yeah, that's that's really that's really cool. And um, I mean, LinkedIn has been has been super platform especially when they've changed the entire model of what they want to do with it um bringing more of the social aspects and then and it's just not just linkedin but people that are on linkedin they're like you know why not use this network to share what they're about why not share it to all the people they're already connected to because that human connection and that those relationships is what makes people work together better because because 
like you said, you know, you you had to clear the cobwebs, and you've been on LinkedIn for a while, and I'm in the same boat. You know, I've been on there since the very beginning, and um, every single thing that I had, it was just a resume post place for me, and I was just constantly connecting with recruiters, and uh, I never really used LinkedIn as a platform to find or connect with people to find jobs. But as, as you and I have realized in the past year, it's become a much more social, much more human network. Yes, I, I entirely agree. I think that also reflects our need as human beings just to have a sense of belonging. You know, we, uh, you know, we may, many people may join LinkedIn or, or other networking platforms to originally to, you know, hire employees and so forth. But it's more than that. It's really about connecting with people on a human level and making each other better individuals, mm-hmm. better in our jobs, um, yeah. you know, more knowledgeable and, and, and growing our confidence through those interactions and um, helping each other when we run into issues. I mean, how many times... I've seen online, either in direct messaging or uh, on a post, where somebody mm-hmm. is asking for information uh, about how to do something. Just the other day, somebody who I met probably eight months ago, she's in the UK, mm-hmm. uh, posted something about wanting to learn how to use Adobe InDesign and Illustrator. Mm. And so I replied to her post and said, hey, you, you, most people don't realize that I do this, but I know those programs. I, I could develop a whole e-learning course on my own and teaching people how to do this. I'm here for you if you have any questions. So she was really appreciative of that. And I'm glad I saw that post on the feed. I just caught it by accident as yeah. I was scrolling. Um, so I was I felt really happy that I was able to you know, reach out a hand to someone who I appreciate, who helped me back when I was getting started and learning to Mm -hmm. become comfortable online. Nice. See, those are the kind of stories that people don't really know. They're like, whoa, how, how did, like, how did you get to 16,000 followers or, you know, it's, it's all, you just got to have to put content out there, connect with people and learn what you can do for them. Right. Absolutely. I think that that's totally what it is. I, I believe it was probably March. Oh, no, I think maybe February, February of 2017, mm-hmm. uh, approximately that I started really getting into LinkedIn. And I had perhaps 300 followers back then. Mm-hmm. And, and now I'm, I'm whatever over 16,000. But it's, it's, it's just been, um, I think a reaction to the consistency of, of my posts and um, just the the realness of them. You know, yes. I I do share personal stories uh, mm-hmm. in some of my videos or written posts, but mm-hmm. I I make them relatable in some way. I'm not just out there talking about myself, which will be boring because we all have lives, you know, that that are pulling us in different directions. But I try to share stories that in some way will uh, provide some value, either uplift, inspire, educate, mm-hmm. entertain people, uh, make them feel good, better about themselves at the end, or, or give them some kind of takeaway, something they can do better at work or mm-hmm. when they get home to their families to improve how they're communicating with each other uh, interpersonally. Yeah. Um, so I, I just love all that. No, that uh, me too, because um, without those communications, without those um, connections, we just feel lost because a lot of the times um, we're just looking for that connection because we are we're on these social networks either to connect or to pass some time. Most people that are looking to connect, they'll, they're looking for those amazing stories and then um, you'll see them commenting on the stories. And um, it's really cool. Love it. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, oh. one, one of the things that got mm-hmm. me into, because um, I talked about how I do, you know, articles and written posts and so forth, mm-hmm. but the vid, touching a little bit more on the videos, one of the reasons that I started doing the videos mm-hmm. uh, last year, well, there, there are multiple reasons. One of them was I was looking for a way for to, to be able to collaborate with my team at work. So mm-hmm. they were interested in, in what I was doing on LinkedIn, although they didn't really want to get get too involved in being online themselves. 
And right, so okay. the idea of collaborating on a scripted web series um, came to me and we ended up doing some videos together, which we then, uh, I named Sunnyvale Incorporated, just like a funny name for, for the video series, which the company has on their YouTube playlist now. Yeah. Um, but it's just been a fun way for us to work together and have fun. So whatever we, whatever little movie we've put out is generally comedically inspired, but it ties into some relevant, relevant theme in the workplace. Uh, whether it's you know how men and women communicate and how to how to help us all understand each other better, or how do you react if somebody as silly uh, like office thievery is someone steals your sandwich from the refrigerator, how are you mm -hmm. going to re respond? There's just like a whole funny episode we did on that, um, or about yeah. team building uh, games and and so forth. So that that's one of the series of videos that I've had a lot of fun working on that has helped me have uh, an even better experience at work and, and enable our team to have fun together. Um, but apart from that, you know, I was walking around in the city of Falls Church um, near where I live mm -hmm. and I saw a coffee cup in the, I was in the park and I saw an empty, a discarded coffee cup in the lawn, like the grassy mm -hmm. area. I picked it up and, and threw it away. My daughter was a little distance away playing on the swings but this coffee cup caught my attention because on it was the logo for a coffee shop that I had frequented. It wasn't just any coffee shop. It was a, mm -hmm. a specific coffee shop that I knew of at the time that was family run. And they were actually working their tails off to stay in business because um, it's, mm -hmm. it's very competitive. And their business wasn't doing very well at the time. It's doing much better today. But at the time, I realized, I'm like, my gosh, to anybody walking by this coffee cup thrown on the lawn, it's just yeah. a piece of trash. It's an empty coffee cup. But I know the story behind this coffee cup, the story and the people behind this business. Yeah. And if more people knew their story, I just know so many more people would be attracted to them and, right. and want to give them their business because they don't realize that how badly they need it. Uh, these yeah. people worked very long hours, we had their kids in the coffee shop during their, their homework late at night, and they were just breaking even. They weren't even paying themselves for many yeah. months. Um, and so it just made me realize how the videos that we put out online can be purposeful. They can be human. They can appeal to us on an emotional level yeah. and, and still enable us to make a sale, you know, what, which people think we're, we're out there trying to sell products, but you don't want to be sales. You want to right. be, you want to show people why it's important, you know, and, exactly. and the, the authenticity and the love that's wrapped, that's all wrapped in. Wow. That see, see all the, that shows your creativity level. I mean, all of the stories that you've told so far are like told me, like totally speak out to me that, you know, you're a writer, you're somebody who thinks through when you're talking about, I mean, I'm, I'm a long way away from that, from that, but it's, it's what we, it's what we love about you. I mean, you put everything in perspective and it, it takes, it takes a lot of time. And I think a lot of the things that we do with our life, and the journeys that we take and the things that we do help us become those, that kind of person. And, and so, so what I've, what I've seen so far, you know, you've been a graphic designer, which gave you that creative edge and, and ability to pull out all the creative colors and the passion. And then being the editor, you know, being able to read through other people's writings and then get the fluff out and get it get to the point made you a better writer if you if what do you think does that make sense yeah no i totally agree i really do i think that all that goes hand in hand together mm -hmm. really really nicely um yeah. the, the same creativity that you know i i would apply as it is in my design work uh, i apply in my writing and in the video work and it definitely yeah. all th there's a common ground there um and it's funny because when when people refer to me as a writer, which I very much am, mm -hmm. it's so funny how I actually even had to get over my own imposter syndrome a couple of years ago, getting back into writing, um, which I wanted mm -hmm. to do. And, and I took the initiative to pursue that. But 
I, I like I'd worked in that graphic design role for so many years. I almost thought, wait, I, I can't possibly reconnect with that writer side of my brain. How am yeah. I going to do that? And mm-hmm. as soon as I decided that I wanted to do it, it happened. So mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's you telling yourself that you want something badly enough and you're just going to make it work. Um, you know, if, if me today, if I could talk to myself two or three years ago, when I or say three years ago, when I was still designing, The advice I would have given to myself just three years ago Mm. was that the same energy, the same energy that you invest in dreaming, whether it's a small dream or a big dream, it's the same amount of energy. So I would have told myself to dream bigger because that that's all it takes is dream bigger and allow yourself to go that way. Um, I think it's important to set goals. I also don't like to get um, too far ahead of myself um, because I, I worry sometimes if you make a goal that's really hard and like a hard and fast goal, you aren't really living for the now anymore. And, and you're no. always chasing that imagined um, future where everything might be better than it is today. But but it is important to, to think a few steps ahead and um, and not let fear hold you back from trying something new or reconnecting with it with something that you used to do you're absolutely right and um and facing my fears and and getting into doing the podcast right so i started a podcast last year i was like and i and i had wanted to do it for a while and i even started one uh about 20 2012 with my cousins but we weren't able to take it too far because of the time constraints um, that we had. We were in different time zones. The applications and the software that was available wasn't as high tech. Um, but I mean, I had resolved all those issues, but it all came down to, okay, you still need to spend time, uh, you know, curating the content. You need, to, you need to spend the time to edit the audio get it all cleaned up and then put it out there for the world to hear. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Yeah. I've, I've seen you posting uh, a lot more on Instagram and, and it's so exciting when I see a new episode come up, I want to check it out right away because I've learned so much from listening to the other uh, guests that you've had on. It's, it's wonderful. And I'm, I'm glad to see you doing that. I actually need yeah. to do the same thing. You're inspiring me because like I said, I've written so many articles and I have so mm-hmm. many videos that I run in tandem with them for the company and mm-hmm. and just for myself that I need to share those more widely. I need to go back and actually post more, much more of them on LinkedIn, um, yeah. find ways to repurpose them. You know, I've, I've got information about even how to turn, just quickly turn a, an article into um, more of a video um, mm-hmm. with, with background film and captions that I, I want to experiment. So I have a lot of content, but I, I, I'm trying to look into new ways to also sharing that. So that's why I'm still holding on to so much. But but seeing that's you true. crank all these episodes out, it gets me going. I'm like, all right, I need to do. I need I need to channel Janae's energy. <laughs> I'm so glad because I'm looking at everybody posting videos on on LinkedIn. I was like, oh my god, I haven't posted any videos on LinkedIn, but I'm still building content. Oh yeah, with this podcast. <laughs> you definitely are, and the videos I've seen you do are great. I think it's important to remember also that you know our audience is so large, and not everybody consumes information the same way you know we we have videos there's um articles there's podcasts uh, i mean just there's so many different avenues through which people are accessing their content and so it's good to i think to diversify so absolutely you know, like you've done a podcast and if if there's information in the podcast that you learn about that can make a good article you could probably just write something real uh, mm-hmm. relatively easily that would come out nicely and and there you go. Now you have an article on LinkedIn that you've posted yeah. as well. Absolutely. So, so what I've been doing, so I'll tell you a little bit too, because I've been researching a lot on automation and uh, setting systems in places. So like, for example, setting up this call with you, right? So I have, I'm using a scheduling software that, you know, you go in there, you schedule your appointment time, and then the software sends an email reminder. First, it just sends a confirmation, then it sends a reminder. So I've worked on those templates to make sure that it sends you the correct link. 
and I figured out why it was sending the wrong link or not putting the lower cases because when you put in your name, you usually put capital, you know, you usually, usually capitalize the first letter and it's basically grabbing that exact name and sending it out as a link. And there's no control over, okay, what is going to come out. So, so you know, so there's systems in place that you got to put. And what I've been discovering, I've, I've discovered a few tools, especially for podcasting. So if, like you said, you have a lot of content, written content, there's an Amazon service called Poly. And Amazon Poly will take your written articles and convert it into audio. And I don't know what it sounds like, but I'm guessing it might sound like Alexa because she's essentially taking those same words, written content, and converting it into audio. Oh, that's fascinating to learn about. I'm glad you mentioned it. Yeah. So if you do have a blog post, I, th- um, I'm, I haven't tested it yet. I have some uh, testing area set up for me to test that out, but I haven't done that yet. But um, I've been, like myself, I've been doing blog posts for since 2006 and 2005 and I have a lot of written content on my other blog post that um, I'll go on there every once in a while and I'll share an article about this and that but I'm not sharing that stuff on LinkedIn I should be because of uh, my broad uh, technology passion in the different things and so it's it's all it's a I guess all it takes is time and effort and getting that um, format right. I mean, the marketing of it all is is really, really essential on how you get it right. And I lately I've been hearing a lot about funnels and setting up your funnel right, setting up your landing page, bringing you know talk talking to the right kind of people that might be interested in your content. Because um, when you're marketing, you don't want to market it to everybody because then you have a very small res- response rate. But then when you have content, like, for example, the stories that you're posting are very deep and thoughtful. And that's one of the reasons. Well, that's only that's not the only. Let me say it right. That's one of the reasons like why people are so attracted to it, but then also how LinkedIn markets that content because they want more engagement. They want more people seeing more content. And it's, it's weird how they have their algorithm set up. So um, yesterday uh, I was, I saw this video that Errol mentioned talked on. And uh, the question was, what, what are you going to do when Instagram goes away tomorrow? Because there's there's so many people flocking to Instagram, right? There's so many people flocking to the latest and latest um, platform. So this gentleman said, "Well, um, it doesn't matter what platform your information is on. What matters is the idea that you talk about. Like for example, Jesus is the greatest influencer." You know, there was no Instagram, there was no LinkedIn, YouTube, you know, it was all word of mouth and, you know, and um, so you, as long as you have good ideas and you're reaching out to people, you, you should never have to worry about these platforms and what's happening to your content. I agree. I think it's just totally, it's brilliant. I think as long as you're staying uh, in a consistent habit of producing your content, and sharing it through whatever channels are available at that moment mm-hmm. that you're comfortable with. Just keep doing it because you'll you'll continue growing your audience and, and continue growing in your skill and your craft. And yeah. um, you know, if you do have your your own website, that's wonderful because, like you said, you can then learn and properly establish uh, you know the the sales funnel and process to get people coming to your site to look into your services. Uh, products yeah. or services. Actually, it's funny because being on LinkedIn for the past year, uh, although I'm working full time for this publisher, I- I've mm-hmm. always had a side business as well. Um, Capital Publishing Corporation is, is the mm-hmm. business through which I, I brand that. Uh, so it's, it is incorporated uh, formally, but I've, I've done a variety of things through that company, primarily graphic design work. 
and some social media consulting. But I wasn't actively marketing that the past year at all. I, I mm. because I was so just entirely 150% dedicated to my current job. But because of all the content I've been sharing, not only did that engagement that I was putting out there raise awareness about my publisher and their products, it increased curiosity from the community about me as, as an mm -hmm. individual, as a professional and what I do and what else I'm capable of. So that, that has actually generated quite a number of inquiries, direct messages from people who yeah. needed help in different capacities exactly. and has created business opportunities for me when I had time <laughs> to yes. invest uh, that I could build those out. So it's, it's definitely, I, I believe that there's a great return on your investment on any channel, mm -hmm. um, not just bottom line in terms of, you know, what, how much more money you're able to bring in for, for yourself to feed your family and so forth. But, you know, just in personal growth, it's wonderful. And relationship exactly. building that that's very, very uh, fulfilling. Yeah, very, very true. So some of the questions that I like to ask, um, or what is one hobby that you wish you got into? One hobby that I wish I got into? You know what? Um, I would say that I, so this is sort of, sort of um, would be new to me again if I were to pick up guitar playing because I actually mm -hmm. played guitar when I was young. Uh, I played in church every week with the music teacher. It was one of the few times growing up that I was willing to get in front of an audience of people. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, and I just, I loved music. I guess that was another uh, just way, creative outlet for me back then was music. And, but over the years, like once I got to high school, I, I just got so busy with other things. I abandoned the guitar. I don't even know where, what my parents did with it. They probably saw that I wasn't using it <laughs> and they sold it or something um, and used it to, to pay for something else that I was doing, um, which was smart of them. But I, I think that I would, I wish I had not stopped playing, um, but it's never too late to go back to it. So yes. that, that's actually something that's been on my mind that I'd like to go back to the guitar. So I love music. I love it. And um, that was always my favorite instrument to play. Awesome. All right. So what is your favorite movie or TV show? And if none, how about a book? <laughs> um, that's another great question. I will say uh, that in terms of movies, there are so many. But my favorite one, one of my favorite ones that I always circle back to is Moonstruck. Um, mm -hmm. that's not a movie that a lot of people may instantly know or remember because I, I believe it, it was in the late eighties, mm -hmm. uh, that it came out, but it, it starred, um, Cher. She won, um, best actress award Oscar for it. I believe, uh, oh. Olympia Dukakis, who I think won the Oscar for best supporting actress, uh, mm -hmm. possibly, um, and then Nicolas Cage and Danny Aiello. There's some, gr some great, um, actors in, in the movie. And I love mm -hmm. it because it's a romantic comedy, which, which is always fun. I, I'm very drawn to those, but it's not just any kind of romantic comedy. It's just these characters are so wrapped up in turmoil. They each have different stories going on throughout the film. And, mm -hmm. and the longer the movie goes on, just their lives converge. And it's interesting to see how they re their relationships um, either break <laughs> or become stronger. <laughs> Um, yeah. so it's just funny. I don't want to give away all, all the good, the good parts, but I'd highly recommend Moonstruck. It's, it's, it's really fascinating. Awesome. I will have to check it out. I've not seen that movie, but Nicholas Cage is in, so I, I do have to check it out. He's one of my favorite actors. I don't know why, but he's just got a very, very certain thing about him. Yeah. And the movie set in Brooklyn, it's in New York. So it's, it's just, really, oh, even better. it's really appealing to watch. Just, it's yeah. very visually appealing on screen and it's moonstruck because what, in a way, one of the characters is the moon. Uh, mm. and it's, it's so huge at, at different points of the movie. And it, it, it sort of shows how the moon has some kind of magical influence over these frail personalities uh, mm. that are being featured throughout, for, throughout the movie. So it's, it's really interesting. You know, one interesting fact about the moon is that uh, the moon will bring in, like, it, it pulls, because uh, if you've noticed, the the moon also creates higher tides, 
And um, for for example, in ocean cities, um, when the moon when it's full moon, you have higher tides than when you don't have the full moon because it has a magnetic effect on everything that's on Earth, which is really really cool. Cool. No. Okay. So, what is your favorite superhero? Oh my gosh, my favorite superhero. You know, now that you ask me that, I superhero. Mm. I, you know, it's funny because it, it it's it's reminding me of a conversation that I just had last mm-hmm. week with a class of second graders. <laughs> Do you have time? <laughs> um, so I was, and, and this isn't quite superhero, but it's a superpower. Mm-hmm. So I was standing in front of a, a class of second graders. I'd I'd left work in a hurry, um, skipped lunch. At, to go volunteer at art class to lead a project. Mm-hmm. And I got there. All the second graders were so excited. And I was getting ready to, like, introduce this wildflower collage we were all going to build together. And just very impulsively and adorably, one of the little kids raised her hand. And she looked like a little junior reporter. She had the pencil neatly tucked behind her ear mm-hmm. and, like, this quizzical look on her face. It just you know, it made me laugh. And she just said, what's your superpower? And I said, oh, okay. <laughs> it completely threw me off. But I told her that seeing the good in others was my superpower. Uh, and, you know, she let out kind of like an impressive, whoa. <laughs> like, what is that about, really? How do you see the good in others? And I had to explain. It just basically, that that's one of my, I think, one of the biggest um personal traits, I think, that I have that has enabled me to just be very happy and and generally happy and successful in life and whatever I do, because Mm -hmm. we're always going to be tested by difficult circumstances and difficult personalities. Quite frankly, there are difficult people out there we don't aren't always going to click with. But we have to find a way to still assume good intentions, assume good intentions and see the best in them. Or sometimes take ownership for a conversation that may not go well and think how maybe you contributed to the misunderstanding and whatever. But I think that there's always something good in, in a situation that you can take away or something good you can see in other people or in a way that you can convert a negative um, interaction into a positive reaction for yourself and for the people around you. So that was my superpower. I told her. (laughs) So it was kind of, it was a neat lesson for the class. I think they, they enjoyed talking about that because they all had stories of their own about difficult people, <laughs> difficult kids. No, that's an absolutely neat uh, lesson even for our, our audience over here. Um, what's funny is um, last night I just finished watching, um, there was a three-part season on DC um, TV series, uh, Super Supergirl, uh, Flash, and... Uh, the green arrow and um towards the end of it you know um green arrows like supergirl and the flash they always look for the good in everybody yeah. even the villains even the bad people because there's always good in people there you know you just have to pull it out you just have to believe in them to pull that out and um one of the one of the uh, story that um, Oliver Queen or Arrow, he mentioned himself is that, you know, Leonard Snart, he was a bad guy, but now he's with the legends because there was good in him and they were able to, you know, he was able to believe in him and pull it out. So that's an awesome superpower. Yeah. Actually, cool. it reminds me also, I was talking with my mm-hmm. daughter not that long ago. It was over the holidays. We were both wearing these Scooby-Doo t-shirts because mm-hmm. um, we both love Scooby-Doo, the, the classic episodes. Yeah. And, uh, you know, she was asking me what my favorite thing about Scooby-Doo was. And, and then I asked her and it, basically it was, for example, just how he always stepped up in, in most episodes anyway, how he always mm-hmm. stepped up to face his fear and do the right thing uh, to help, you know, the people around him. And I'm talking to a seven year old. So <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. the conversation only could only get so deep. But, uh, but it, it really meant a lot to her as well. And, you know, she, after I talked to her about this, she came back to tell me that peace fills her heart when she does the right thing. And that must be what Scooby-Doo feels. 
And it just mm-hmm. really touched me. And I'm like, you know what? You're so right. And, and those are the things that draw us to characters on screen, whether they're fictional, whether they're a cartoon, a human, um, you know, those are the things I think that really pull at our heartstrings. That's true. That's true. That's absolutely right. Okay. Well, last question. And then we can tell people where they can find you. I mean, you've already told us. Okay. If you were a board game, what would it be? Oh my gosh. If I was a board game, I would yeah. um, be the, I'm blanking on the name. It's the one where you have to like put a picture on your forehead and the person like sees it. It's headband. I think it's called headband. <laughs> well, well, to be to be super uh, explicit or <laughs> particular, that is not a board game. Oh, I know, I cheat. <laughs> you can <laughs> see, I probably don't play board games well because I'm even cheating on the question. <laughs> yeah. But it, it's just so fun because you have to basically act out um, something without telling the person what it is, and it, mm-hmm. you're trying to guess if the person's acting. Like, yeah. like a monkey or like a, like an animal, like a tree mm-hmm. or what they're trying to portray. So I think anything that involves physical action with the board game is going to be yeah. my favorite. <laughs> okay. It's a multi-sensory kind of, you know, game. Anything like that is great. Perfect. So my, my board game is um, Settlers of Catan. Oh, I, I, have heard of I haven't heard of it. I'm um, sure I, it's, that I, it's kind of like risk that. and monopoly combined. Ah. So it's pretty interesting. That's, that Not, sounds good. Like a very, that's a very brainy game too. I like it. It's brainy, but it's very basic. It's really cool. Yeah. To <laughs> check it out. Awesome. Well, so Michelle, where can people find you? It was really awesome talking with you. Thank you so much. I, I loved our talk as well. Thanks again for having me on. People can find me on LinkedIn. Um, mm-hmm. They can search hashtag Nietzsche Mash uh, or just my name. Also, I'm also on Instagram. So I'm at Nietzsche Mash up there. <laughs> Perfect. Cool. Well, thank you so much for the, for your time. You're welcome. We'll look forward to uh, keeping in touch and um, talk to you soon. All right. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this episode on Hacks and Hobbies. We absolutely appreciate your contribution. You can find additional notes on hacksandhobbies.com. Please share the podcast with your friends and tell them what you learned about our guest today.